Well, uh, like uh, Chen Xi, I think that I, I think that there's a, a fine uh, balance to be struck between uh, you know, trying to educate uh, Singaporeans and give them fair warning about how the how difficult the terrain can be if you operate as a blogger and, and scaring all of them to death, such that everyone decides that well maybe we shouldn't blog after all, right? Or just do it anonymously. Um, that, that would really be against, I think, the, the spirit of what I'm sure this forum is supposed to be about, uh, which I think is uh, supposed to, at the end of the day, I think, encourage uh, Singaporeans to say what they mean, to see, say what they feel, uh, and enlarge our political discourse in Singapore. Uh, so I'm going to focus today, unlike the previous three speakers, on how to man manage uh, political risks as opposed to legal risks. Yeah? Um, my aim is simple, it is to try to describe uh, political terrain that uh, commentators confront so that you can uh, navigate that terrain more knowledgeably. Right? Uh, it is not intended to tell you what path to take or whether or not to take certain risks yeah? uh, because that in the end depends on what we want to achieve. Yeah? But I think it would be um, uh, the, the, the situation we want to avoid, whether I think in the legal sphere or the political sphere, uh, is to get into some kind of trouble that we didn't foresee uh, and weren't prepared for. Yeah. Uh, so the, the aim, I think, I hope that this, this workshop uh, can achieve, is that uh, we know what the obstacles are, right? we know what the limitations of freedom are, and then we can make up our own minds about whether to enter that terrain or not. So, so it is about creating the knowledge about the terrain rather than try to advise you as a consultant, uh, you know, how you should think. Right? Uh, so what we have heard so far is the, uh, the stuff that can be said within the law and the stuff that will fall outside of the law that might get you into legal trouble. Uh, what I want to go on now to uh, try to explain is even if you stay within the law, right, there are of course a different set of risks that you might uh, confront. Um, uh, but to be complete, uh, you know, to complete this graphic, let me start right at the center. Uh, of course, there is such a thing as pro-establishment speech. You know? So if there are people here from, uh, what is that group, um, fabrications about the PAP and so on, <laughs> so that, that would be right at the center then. Kept uh, here and so on, right at the center. But even then, it's time. If you want to go out of pro-establishment, stay within the law, then there's actually quite a wide range of approaches that you can take. And that's where the discussion won't be complete without including this thing called the <laughs> yeah? So if you look at this, uh, if you try to understand the logic behind this uh, sort of uh, Venn diagram, uh, it is possible to be legal, yeah, to act legally, but outside of the markets. Uh, or it's also possible to be legal but and critical within the Wobi markets. Uh, then of course it's possible to be not critical and legal, which puts you squarely in the So so broadly speaking, this is the terrain that we want to explore. Uh, by the way, so, uh, if there are individuals who believe in things like civil disobedience and so on, Gopal and Nair, Chichin Chuan, in, in a past life, I guess, right? Uh, that will take you outside, right? Deliberate breaking of the law as a campaign of civil disobedience. So really there are one, two, three, four, at least four different strategies you can take. Uh, Non-legal, legal outside movie markers, legal within movie markers, and post that. And like I said, I'm not telling you where to put yourself, but I'm saying that uh, assuming you want to, uh, assuming that this group, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, would want to be in the critical camp rather than the pro-establishment camp, but then I think the key thing that we want to look at is this thing called Bobby Market. So let's take a closer look. Right? <laughs> uh, what, what is this boundary all about? First of all, what are Bobby Markers? Uh, I define Bobby Markers as lines of political acceptability. Yeah? Uh, the law in Singapore, of course, is already tough enough to deal with. Bobby Markers, in a sense, are actually tougher. Right? The reason why they're tougher is because they're not written down anymore. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the, with the law, you can actually go to statutes.agc.gov.ng and read all about the laws in the all in black and white. Of course, the way they apply may be tricky, but at least they're written down somewhere, right? OB markers are not written down. Uh, they are also highly contextual and they move. 
outside of OB markers uh, in the past. Uh, say, say for example, let me give you a concrete, concrete example. When I was in journalist at Straits Times, uh, it was well outside the OB markers to even acknowledge that there was a gay culture in Singapore. Right? Whereas now it's quite, it's not, you know, it's not outside of the OB markers to talk about sexual politics. Yeah? Uh, so that's a simple example of how OB markers shift, usually in, the, in a more progressive direction, fortunately. Yes. Yeah? But not always. Uh, when it comes to the law, right, the, the thing that can get you, if you break the law, of course, is that you can lose your liberty by going to jail, or you can be financially penalized either through a fine or through a lawsuit and so on. So what is the cost of breaching an OB marker? It's neither a jail, nor a fine, nor a lawsuit. It's a loss of political capital. Yeah, it's a loss of political capital. What does this mean? Essentially, it, it could mean a loss of official access to decision makers. Right? It could mean um, uh, some kind of uh, hit in terms of your job. Right? getting a job, getting promoted in certain contexts, and it could mean a loss of economic opportunities. Uh, if, for example, you want to do business with the government. Yeah. Uh, so this is, can be significant, or it might not be significant for you, but that's basically what we're talking about when we talk about OB markers. It's a loss of political capital as a result of breaching that line in some obvious or consistent way. Uh, let's be clear, OB markers, although the term is not used everywhere, um, it, they exist everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but OB markers in more liberal societies uh, are less of a problem uh, in the sense that the space is wider and the risk is more. <laughs> okay. uh, so they exist everywhere. It's not, you know, it's not as if there are no blacklists even in the US right, uh, of people who are troublesome or sort of activist oriented and the government doesn't want to do business with and so on. But uh, the families are much wider. Uh, in Singapore, we operate in a system where uh, the OB markers matter more uh, for two reasons. One, because the government is hypersensitive to criticism. Yeah? Uh, so uh, things that are said in the course of political debate uh, in freer societies that we've just taken as, well, this is normal political discourse. In Singapore, it they, is they, they, seen as a kind of a, uh, an affront to our, you know, value, our Asian values. You know, respect for authority and so on. We shouldn't be talking about leaders this way and so on. Right? So the, the irony, of course, is that in most of the Asian societies I know, they're quite cool about insulting politicians. Yeah? Uh, so Singapore se seems to be the only Asian country left yeah, that, that, that believes in its Asian value of respect. <laughs> um, uh, OB markers is also a problem because of the sheer dominance of the government. So it means that if you lose political uh, capital, uh, it is not just your relationship with the political authorities that can be affected. It might hit you in many other ways, right? Uh, so if you're a businessman, it could mean that, who knows, does it mean that GLCs won't do business with you, right? Uh, could it mean if you're an NGO, does it mean that uh, statutory boards won't do business with you? So the government's hard to avoid, yeah? uh, simply because of its dominance. Um, if you look precisely at the media, uh, licensed media like new, uh, newspapers and broadcasters have no choice but to stay within OB markers yeah. uh, because they cannot run away from needing the political capital. The reason why they cannot run away from needing the political capital uh, is because of the press laws and the broadcasting laws that give the government the authority to change the bosses anytime they like. So it means that uh, for uh, an editor to keep his job and not be replaced by a civil servant, he does in fact need to, in addition to checking his sort of bank account and his household bills, he needs to check his political account as well. Yeah? If he runs out of political capital, it means that he will be replaced. So they do have to worry about OB markers because if they are seen as someone crossing OB markers too much, they can be replaced on the level. Of course, many bloggers don't need to um, abide by OB markers, uh, simply because they don't need political capital. Uh, but even this, you know, the situation would differ from blogger to blogger, right? Um, uh, there would be bloggers in the back of their mind who say that, well, no way, uh, I may want to get a job in a stat board, right? And so I better be careful what I say. 
um, there may be bloggers who are activists who work with um, NGOs that have a pretty dependent relationship with government and they end up do having to watch uh, uh, their relationship with the only markers. So it's not really true that all bloggers don't have to bother about only markers, they might need to. Yeah, but essentially you can say that certainly uh, the, the, the bloggers are relatively free of the burden of having to worry about only markers right, compared with those who work in the mainstream media. Um, to give you a very concrete example of uh, what criticism would sound like in a, within OB markers and outside of OB markers context, these are two hypotheticals, right? So uh, the first one, something I just made up this morning, uh, you, know, you could say, I mean, I could write in, say, uh, an op-ed piece that I gave to the Straits Times, and I'm fairly certain that this would not be problematic, that they would be prepared to publish it. You know, somewhere in the story I could say some ministers earn more than at their previous jobs, causing critics to question if high ministerial pay is at odds with the self-sacrificial ideals of public service. It's a critical point, but I don't think it, it actually goes beyond what we want this. I'm quite confident of that, right? So if I were to write a piece uh, with that paragraph, I don't think it would be edited out by the Straits Times. All my experience uh, you know, working with the Straits Times and for Straits Times tells me that it's actually okay. Yeah. Critical but not for the OB markers. What would be what would cross the OB markers is the second version. Yeah. A newly appointed Minister of State John Lee earns 40% more now than in his previous job, showing that the pay formula is overshooting the target of market pay in some cases. Why is it why does this cross the OB markers? Because it's getting personal. Right? It's getting personal. It's attacking an individual politician. Right? And basically saying that this individual politician is overpaid. And again, it's slightly different. The difference in nuance from the first one. But uh, they're both basically making the same point. But the second one is getting a little too personal, a little too uncomfortable. It is not yet defamatory by any means, right? Uh, would anyone be sued for this as a libel statement? No, because it's factual. It's purely factual. Yeah. Uh, so my expert law panel tells me that this is still within that gray line of legal, but it just crosses an only mark. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that the government will say, well, who's writing this? And uh, let's, you know, let's track this person, and if there's really blacklist the person. Not fine, not arrest, sue, just blacklist the uh, I didn't write it down, but I'm trying to think what would it take to cross into the illegal or defamatory mode. It would be something like, uh, newly appointed MOS John Lee earns 40% now than his previous job, uh, and it is not surprising that this money faced son of a bitch right, <laughs> has given up his private sector career because he's always known him as a greedy asshole. <laughs> okay? So even if, it's, even if you take out son of a bitch and greedy and so on, right, and even if it's written in a very polite way, the allegation that this minister. Right, has uh, joined the government for the money, and I'm, I'm guessing would invite a lawsuit. Would that, would that be right? Yeah. So that would be yeah. because then you're you're basically saying that he's joined government for the money, which he doesn't deserve. Yeah. That clearly would lower him in the in his reputation, in the eyes of right thinking Singaporeans. Prima facie, the fabric. I you can talk like a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, but these two, legal one across the OB markers, one not. Uh, and then you can play these experiments with other sort of, you know, very, very high profile critical points you want to make. And let's, let's maybe you want to do a coaching example for, you know, uh, which I'll just think on my feet. Now, how, what are the coaching examples sound like? Uh, critical, but within the OP markers, uh, would be something like, um, what's that? Goes? <laughs> would be just a, a factual statement like um, uh, Ho-Ching's uh, appointments in the public sector have attracted its fair share of controversy, right? And, it is, um, uh, and has been criticized both locally and in the foreign media. Purely factual, that can appear in straight spines, no? yeah? Across the OB markers, but not yet defamatory, would be something like Ho-Ching's appointments, uh, raise serious doubts about, you, know, you cannot say nepotism, that's already defamatory. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult. Um, uh, you know, uh, raises troubling questions about whether Singapore really is so bereft of talent 
Even for some of the most sensitive issues in Singapore, if you think through it hard enough and you have a ready panel of lawyers, you have your mobile phones and so on, <laughs> number one, it is certainly possible to make points within the law. Yeah, as Jesse showed, showed with the this top 10 examples. Uh, but I would say it's even possible to stay within the OB markers. You have to make quite tough points that are within OB markers that don't, you know. Uh, cause you to have your phones barbed by the ISD. <laughs> I'm guessing. Depends how free the ISD is. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, in general, in general, and my experience is that uh, policy critique yeah, is fine. It, it, you, know, you can remain well within the OB markers and criticize government policies all you like. Yeah. Uh, you would be crossing the, this, this invisible line if you stray into personal attacks, right? question the competence of uh, government officials. Uh, certainly, you'd be cross, uh, crossing the line in government's eyes if you start questioning the government's legitimacy. Right? So saying, saying, transpar uh, saying that Singapore's trans uh, transport system leaves much to be desired for the following reasons, fine, it's a little within movie markers, uh, to say that uh, the recent MRT debacles uh, have eroded the, the PAP's right to govern. Okay, that's you know, basically saying that we're taking you on. And that's basically what a OB marker means. And when the government says you have crossed an OB marker, it means that they're going to treat you like a political opponent. Yeah? So if you go beyond just questioning transport policy and say that this shows that the government's unfit to govern, then you're declaring yourself as a political opponent and you accept the loss in political capital that comes with yeah. um, Of course, uh, if you express support for the opposition openly and often, that will take you outside of the movie markers. And if you support human rights causes like Marua and does and so on, that also will take you outside. Yeah. Uh, but not illegal, that's, a, that's interesting to know. It's not uh, some of this, of course, has changed. I mean, since the last election, where so many Singaporeans are openly, in fact, making personal attacks, uh, on ministers and so on. I find it hard to believe that everyone who has, even with their own name, criticized ministers personally, now has their own individual file on them, right? It's so that filing cabinet must be very big. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so, so the sort of, uh, those first two points, and even the third, I think, has become so common that I suspect it is now kind of almost acceptable, right? The, the government still, I think, won't have the resources to, to treat, give special treatment to everyone who falls in that box. So I think something like this has happened. Yeah? That basically, um, uh, we're now in this gray area where even criticizing the minister personally and so on, not in, maybe not enough to blacklist you. Uh, the, the real uh, thing, I mean, if you, if you want to stay within the OB markers, uh, then this last box here is the one that you have to uh, essentially if you're doing that then be prepared to be treated as a political yeah? uh, essentially uh, if you start organizing and mobilizing for causes if you start getting your fellow citizens to act with you for some political program or agenda yeah? and that thereby challenging the government's agenda. One way to look at it is in terms of resale and wholesale. Right? If you are a retail consumer uh, of, of politics, yeah? uh, frankly now there's so many of us that the government can't possibly bother about us. So if you're simply just um, uh, you know, uh, criticizing the government on Hardware Zone and Facebook, etc., you know, all sorts of stuff that you're throwing the government, that's kind of retail consumption, and I don't think the government has the resources to blacklist every one of them. My guess, right? Again, don't, this one, I, I, I'm not gonna. Uh, don't come and look for me if I, I've proven wrong. Okay, but uh, my guess is that that is now treated as one of those things. The government can't help it. But if you are in the wholesale business, 
then uh, I think you need to be aware that you'll be given special treatment. So if you're in the wholesale business of uh, selling a course to a larger group, yeah, then uh, you should be prepared to be treated as someone who has crossed the OB market. Unless, of course, the course you're selling is something like join the unions or whatever. Okay. If, it, if it's a very safe course, then you know, you're given a National Day Medal. Right? <laughs> but if it's a course that uh, the government finds uh, problematic, then you would have been judged across the OB market. Um, a, a couple of myths that I think I should share with you. Some regular writers feel that, you know, oh, as long as you're polite, that's fine. You, you, know, you can't be accused of crossing the OB marker if you're polite. I, I don't think that's true. No, I don't think that's true. I mean, the, the government, uh, especially if you're a consistent blogger, if you are polite, but they, you know, they, they can see that you are essentially challenging their authority, if you're trying to get more people to think like you, they, you will be treated like an opponent, no matter how civilized uh, you try to be. Yeah. Uh, the second myth which I've noticed um, uh, is true to the, the cost of even uh, people I know, uh, have known at Straits Times and so on. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem that there's like a balance book. You know? Even if you have a, a record throughout your life of writing quite pro-government pieces, Right? Even a single strongly anti-government piece uh, will negate your past record and you will be treated like an opponent. Right? So I know journalists to whom that has happened. Uh, so they're, they're quite shocked that, you know, all my life I've been you know, basically <laughs> pro-PAP and this one piece gets the government angry and this happens, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah? Uh, so I, I, I don't think you should count too much um, on having a history of flattering the PAP and that somehow gives you the license to then uh, write a uh, very critical piece openly public. Yeah? Uh, so, so these are things to, to be aware of. Um, what is the solution then my own? Well, I, I should tell you that you shouldn't listen to me, right? Because I'm one, I'm one of those who, um, I guess, have always tried to operate within the OB markers. In my own mind, I operate within the, you know, as a critical within OB markers, but I'm very bad at it. So consistently throughout my, my journalism and academic career, although I think I'm operating there, the government thinks I'm operating there. So, so don't listen to me. I, I really am not sure where the line is and so on. Um, but what I would say is this, I think when you are contemplating how to say and what to say and when to say it, etc., it's useful to clarify your mind. Yeah? and not be so consumed by this sort of uh, specter of an all-powerful government that can do anything to you. Uh, because the truth is the government by and large operates quite consistently and quite rationally. We may not like the way it operates, but it is generally quite consistent and rational. You can detect patterns, right? You can detect patterns as to when it will go after someone, whether it's with the law or with uh, political blacklisting and so on. Uh, so I urge you to ask yourself, um, if you uh, want to uh, put up something critical, ask yourself simply, what do you think is the worst that can happen? Yeah. Uh, and once you have concretized that in your mind, what is, that's the worst that could happen to me, uh, then ask uh, how likely is it that that would happen? Um, and then if it happens, can I deal with it? Right? What steps would I take uh, if the worst happens? And then ultimately decide, am I going to take the risk? Uh, I think that's a, it kind of removes the, uh, the myth and, you know, to just think clearly through um, the, the stuff that you have to deal with. Uh, do you ultimately take the risk? I mean, to me, ultimately, that, that's a personal choice, right? It based, uh, based partly on sort of practical uh, conclusions that you come to about how exposed you are or insulated you are from uh, political repercussions. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you're independently wealthy, yeah, uh, you don't depend on government contracts, you don't depend on government for a job, if you're a student and you're 100% sure that you are not going to seek employment for, from Singapore's largest employer, yeah, uh, maybe because your father is going to give you his, you know, his uh, coffee shop business or whatever, right? Uh, then, frankly, there's not much the government can do to you. You're, you're pretty much independent. It doesn't matter if you have no political capital, you'll be fine. Yeah? So that, therefore, your appetite for risk can go up. 
So that's a practical calculation you can make. But ultimately, I think it's a values calculation. Yeah, ultimately, you just have to ask yourself, well, even if uh, I can be hurt by being politically blacklisted, uh, maybe it is still the right thing to do, right? Uh, because that, uh, what, I, what I want to say is consonant with the way I want Singapore to be. I'm just going to accept the risk. This, so these are calculations no consultant can guide you with. It's ultimately something that you search within yourself. Uh, the larger challenge though, I mean, what, what I've been talking about so far is how to manage the um, terrain as it is. But of course, we also want to look at the terrain as it should be, right? Uh, the larger challenge, therefore, I think, is to extend the political and legal limits for uh, political speech and to encourage uh, active citizenship. Yeah? So we shouldn't be satisfied with this, we should be aiming for, uh, for this, right? Much more space. Uh, for uh, for open discourse, both legally and within a holding on this. I've been trying to think about what it would actually take, you know, what does it mean to uh, to extend the OB markers? I mean, uh, as far as extending the law, that's simple. Uh, it's not simple, but it's straightforward. It's straightforward in the sense that we've got to get some of those laws rewritten. Yeah? Uh, but what about OB markers? There, there, there's no law to rewrite when it comes to OB markers. Yeah? Uh, it seems to me to boil down to this, uh, that Basically, the, um, the effect of political blacklisting uh, would be diminished and therefore people would be freer if uh, more of our institutions were independent. Yeah? Um, and therefore not influenced by political blacklists. The reason why OB markers are so powerful now and why this political blacklisting is so costly to individuals is because the state uh, is, is so large, and the political interests of the AP, uh have seeped into the way many institutions operate. Yeah? Uh, and this affects individuals, groups, all sorts, right? So, so for example, an arts group that the PAP may not like because it, uh, it has been consistently critical of the PAP, why should their funding from the National Arts Council be affected by the fact that this arts group crosses political OB markers? Right? Uh, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. The, the National Arts Council should make independent professional decisions that, uh, that do not refer to the interests of the political party that happens to be in government. Yeah? So we see this repeated in all sectors, where institutions that should be behaving uh, professionally, uh, independently, transparently, their decisions about everything from funding to hiring to promotions and so on, um, are influenced by the political interests of the party uh, and, and that's in the end how OB markers work.